find it. There are lots worse things than what we're going through in terms of the situations. We're in a famine of the word. And our situation is such that we have to be shouting it, living it, proclaiming it more clearly than ever. As schools command, you can't speak it or you can't say it or they hold you accountable if you want to read it out loud or any number of things. There is a famine of the word. And a famine means that people are starving because they no longer know what the Word says. They're no longer in the Word. How much of the Bible were you in all alone today, this week, this past ten days, that you actually let the Word of God speak to your heart? Not some nice devotion book, not something else that you saw on YouTube, just you and the Lord in the Word of God. There can be a famine in your own life of God interacting with you. It isn't that God doesn't use devotions and songs and other beautiful things. It's that sometimes we have drifted so far away from the Word, we are listening to what other people are telling us the Word is saying. And you can't let that happen in your life. You've got to understand, I always used in high school, it made everyone groan. It goes, I'll kiss your girlfriend, I'll let you know if she's a good kisser or not. The guys go, oh, that's so gross. I said, well, why wouldn't you do that? Well, because she's our girlfriend. I said, good. I don't want to kiss her. What are you doing with God's word? What do you mean? Are you reading it? No. Oh, you're going to let me read it and me kiss the face of God and he'll hold on to me so I can tell you how great it is. Is that what you think is a righteous, reasonable thing to do? And you begin to understand, they would look at me and make that little transition and they would understand. It's pretty foolish for us to live like that. I said, God isn't angry when somebody else is helping you understand the word. But when you're not alone with God in the word, you're stealing from that intimate personal time that God wants with you. We are dealing with a starvation of the word. And unfortunately, in many cases, it's in the church. And when the church or the pastors or the people sitting in the pews are not faithful, excuse me, faithful to it, there's a serious lack of that word in people's lives. And when that happens, your life begins to deteriorate and you begin to lose the very thing that God wants to give you. And that's reassurance and that's that personal intimacy, that's that personal holding on to you. And it's even not a quantitative thing. If you're in one verse and you let and meditate on that and it's a verse that means something to you, I always go, pick up a gospel, pick up something, start reading. When you hit a verse that actually has meaning for you, stay on that verse. Let God speak to you through that verse. And you begin to understand what God was saying through Amos, a famine of the word right in the middle of having the word in your house at your fingertips, and yet never really reading it and allowing the intimacy of you and God to be there. Many, many moons ago, when there was only black and white, uh, I was moved by this video. I tried to find the modern ones, but there are some words that aren't used, and there's some context that's been changed. And if you've ever watched an old movie... Sometimes the older movies are far more faithful to the book than the new movies who add a lot of fluff and a lot of things and they drop things. So I'm going to show this to you. Please tolerate it from me. We're going to pray it works. I'll give them a little setup for you, honey, just a minute. And it is Martin Luther. He's standing before the Diet of Worms, Worms in, in more pro- properly pronounced in German, and the, po- the Pope and the King or not the Pope's representative and the king are there, and they want to kill him. They want to kill him. He's exposing their unfaithfulness to the word. He's bringing out into the open through his writings the things that they're doing wrong, and they want him dead. And so they're trying to trap him, and they won't let him share or argue his thoughts. They offered him two questions. Question one, 
Are these writings that we put on the table in front of you, are they your writings? Well, I, and he shut up. They basically said, we will only let you answer. Are these your writings, yes or no? He goes, yes, they're my writings. Second question. The question is, do you deny, reject, turn your back on these things? Or do you accept them and continue to support them? And then we get to the point in the movie where Martin Luther is standing there knowing the sword is at his throat. Not knowing, like you and I may know if we know the story, that a group of his friends end up kidnapping him as he leaves the the diet there, the place where they were having it, and hiding him out so they can't kill him. And that's the setting. Please understand, 500 years ago, when you start reading A Mighty Fortress and singing that song, you're singing a song that this man felt in the deepness of his heart, looking at death in the face, saying, a mighty fortress is my God, and I can trust him. That's where you have to be in the circumstances of your life, in the situations with your family, friends, acquaintances, government, with all the threats and the inconsistencies that we've got out there. So keep that all in context as we watch this little excerpt. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that the sound comes through. If not, read lips. We'll try and give it a shot. Prepare to answer. They gave him one more day. He leaves. This is his if I lack the manners that befit this court. I was not brought up in king's palaces, but in the seclusion of a cloister. I am asked to retract these writings, but they are of different kinds. In some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. Most serene emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, If I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. In my 
12-year-old mind that has uh, bore fruit all my life. Uh, simply because I could hear it. And the, the obviously the, the whole movie is uh, lasts an hour and ten minutes or whatever it lasts. And this is kind of the near the end at this point. But where he uh, recognizes I cannot and I will not because unless scripture tells me otherwise. That's the kind of courage is going to be required. That's the kind of determination. And so when we start reading and understanding these passages, I want you to turn now, if you would, to Matthew 11, because we're going to be working in there. And I started in Matthew 11 at verse 12, simply because I didn't want to go back and explain everything else before it. I'd run out of time. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. That man was demonstrating forcefulness. What was he bringing? The true gospel. It will not be silenced because brothers and sisters, men and women, are willing to stand their ground against, in this case, political forces combined with religious forces and unwilling to compromise. And it's what is needed in his church, in our families, in our relationships even now because we're finding ourselves far too willing to compromise and quit. And that becomes where you begin to understand this and finishing the thought off again back in Matthew. It goes, uh, is forcefully advancing and forceful men are laying hold of it. And then it goes on and you begin to understand. Luther grabbed hold of the gospel and he said, I will not recant. I cannot change this. I will not go in a different direction. And he stood his ground. There was a forcefulness without the fisticuffs, but there was a forcefulness that you all could see. You could see it in the intensity of his face. And I remember seeing it as a kid and understanding what he was doing, what it was going to take, the courage it took for a man to stand up against the political powers that had life and death over him and say, I will not recant. I will not change. I know who my God is and I know who I am trusting in. And so that's that concept of understanding that this thing is moving forward and there's a forcefulness of the kingdom of heaven. It will go into men's hearts. It will shout in the middle of communist countries. Why is it socialists hate the Bible? Why is it communist countries hate the Bible? Why is it you're under attack because you're Christians? What's unique about your belief? You have an unbelievable force behind the truth of the gospel and the word of God that shuts the mouths of the wickedness and the foolishness of the socialists and those in governmental positions who are trying to tell you how to live and what to do. And in your mind, in your heart, you're living by a totally different set of voices. You're hearing something very different. And you understand, even if you stand over me with the authority of life and death over me, I will not recant. And so you begin to understand the significance of the Reformation, the significance of the courage of one individual. I've been reading about how if just one person, just one person begins to stand up, sometimes it'll open the floodgates for all those around them. You usually see it work in an evil way. One person starts to belittle, mock, or make fun of, and the wicked people grab hold of that. But just like you saw with the little ones up here, they stood up. One person said, you can't do that to my sister. And when she needed help, she got more help. And when they needed help, they got more help. That's the call upon the church. That's where we're being called to walk and live and function. And we need to understand the significance of this because it goes on from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, forceful men take hold of it. And it goes, for all the prophets and the law prophesied till John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come, who has ears, let him hear. 
Listen to it. The answer is they don't want to hear. They don't want to play. They don't want what you have to say. Why? Because it breaks the back of communism. It breaks the back of dictatorships. It breaks the back of the woke culture that wants to destroy you because you said one wrong word or expressed it in some way. They've determined it is immoral. They have no idea what grace is. Sola gratia. Grace alone. Sola scriptore. By scripture alone. Sola fide. The three things that are building uh, the whole Reformation on. Fide. By faith alone. And that's where the church rests. And that's where they stand. And that's the kind of commitment they make. When we confessed our faith, we didn't just do that for fun. Those were fighting words. Unwilling to compromise. I stand with my brothers and sisters faithfully upon the word of God. Here's what I believe. Here's where I will stand. And I will stand with them even in the situation, and this is the challenge, that Martin Luther may face. And so we don't leave Martin Luther's out there alone. You saw some of those um, segues into other people's facial expressions. Some of those were very serious friends of Martin Luther, very much aware of what it was like to take on the Pope and the King and all the political powers because everything was wrapped together, politics and religion. All right? And so if a, a country changed its faith, it no longer had allegiance to the Pope and it no longer had allegiance to the emperor. And suddenly, the country would begin moving in different directions. Why are they attacking you? Because you're the Martin Luther of the day. Why do they want to destroy your family? Because your family is proclaiming a gospel if it's real yet. Why? Because when one of them get hurt or attacked, others are standing up. And when that happens, your church surrounds you and stands with you in those circumstances. We have to scare you. We have to bully you. We got to make you afraid. We got to drive you back into the walls of your building where you practice your faith intimately all by yourself. We don't want to hear it out here. We don't know how to handle it out here. It has too much power, too much force. It'll even break the back of a woke movement or a corrupt culture, or a wicked leadership, or a you know, vicious leadership in terms of justice or anything else. That's what you have to continue to stand on. I'm not sure you'll be fighting the Pope, or fighting in particular that. But one of the things that we pick out of later on is this. As it goes on, it says, what can I look at these people and see? They're like children sitting in a marketplace, and they, they want to play games, and so they shout out, Will you play this game with us? And the first one is the dance. Let's celebrate. Let's party. Let's dance. Pretend we're at a fancy party. And the kids don't want to participate. And the next one, they sang a funeral dirge. And they wailed and they moaned like they see the adults crying behind the casket of a dead friend or a loved one. And they didn't want to play that either. And he points out here, it says, you don't want to learn. You don't want to grow. you got to understand how easy it is to do this on both sides. On the side of the Christians that should be standing. Do you want me here to say out loud, God is calling you to be Martin Luther. Uh, don't tell me that. I'm not sure what I'm ready to risk. Or God is calling you to call other people and don't be surprised when they won't listen, when they won't participate, no matter what you say, no matter how you present it, no matter how you offer it to them. And so you begin to understand here as he finishes with that last verse. All right? Jesus or John came with drinking, uh, not drinking or eating, and they said he had a demon. Something wrong with him. Guy lives in the wilderness. We don't want that kind of Christianity, that kind where everything is regulated and, and he's so, so leaving everything behind. And they said Jesus came and he ate and drank. And they call him a glutton and a drunkard and a man who ate with sinners. And the answer comes back, it doesn't matter how we come, you're not going to want to listen, are you? They didn't want to hear him. They wanted to put their hands over their ears. They wanted to shut this man down. The next time they try and shut the church down, please remember, take it personally. 
You are the body of Christ. And every one of you has a role to play in that. And God's call upon your heart is to not back away and be frightened by the mean faces and the cruelty of a government or leadership that is wicked at its core. We've had wicked leadership before. And the church had to step up and stand up. And people had to put their lives on the line and risk everything. Because at the same time, we know that Martin, Martin Luther managed to survive. Other famous reformers and willing people who stood their ground and translated the Bible and other things were killed by the pressures of political and religious forces of the day. This is your moment in time. This is not Martin Luther's moment. This is, is God your mighty fortress or not? Are you trusting in him or are you just saying nice things? Because the challenge is real. The invitation is real. And finally, the last verse comes down and says, Wisdom is proved right by her actions. What you do and don't do testifies to who you are. Don't use words. Live it. Don't use words. Act upon it. He didn't look around to the right or the left. He didn't know if anyone was going to rescue him. He stood there and said, here I stand. I will not recant. I can't do anything less. And so the challenge of Reformation is to see that example and well as others who have lived before, who have stood their ground for the faith, like John the Baptist, who paid with his life, who proclaimed, what you're doing, king, is evil. What you're saying, king, is wicked. And eventually, that was one of the reasons that John got his head chopped off. That is the courage of reformation. That's the courage of revival. That's the courage that's necessary to save your family, to save your marriages, to save your children and your grandchildren. That kind of courage it only comes from your confidence and intimacy with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit being intimately in your life. Pray with me, if you would. <coughs> Lord, we need that re reformation. We need that kind of courage. But I can't bring it up just because I want it, Lord. It's got to come from a confidence that rests fully in you. It's got to come from a conscience that uh, has been cleared by the power of your forgiveness, the truth of your word finally speaking healing to me. It's got to come, Lord, because I have drawn so close to you. I intimately understand your words, your promises, the things you call me to say and do. And like Martin Luther, who stood on your word without anyone around him at the time, that's the kind of place we need to be able to stand. So come and work that in our lives, Lord Jesus, until we honor and praise you in every situation. We pray this in your name, Lord. God's people say. Still doing prayer, right? Am I missing something? Okay. okay. <laughs> if there's any prayer requests or anything, please uh, make sure they come forward. If you didn't get one or you're bringing one up, please bring it up. John, you want to come up? Good. Got this one on? It's not on. going to go on either. There you go. Good. Pray with us, please. Heavenly Father, we come to you. You ask us for our petitions, and we're bringing them to you. You are God. You are the God that, as we confessed earlier, that created, spoke everything that we know into existence. Everything is in your hand, Lord. And uh, grant us the faith to know that uh, uh, you are sovereign, uh, that you have uh, 
put in motion all that there is and our uh, salvation is assured in Jesus Christ. And Lord, in between now and that time when you call us, there's a number of difficulties that we have to walk through. And uh, some of these things we are dealing with right now, one of which is uh, a friend and uh, a son, Nate specifically, but others are in that same situation facing the, uh, the mandates from employers and governments to uh, take a shot. And um, Lord, we pray for guidance and uh, direction and faith in that, in that and, and help in making that decision of how, um, how he and others um, come to that conclusion, that decision. And we pray that you remove fear. We pray for um, protection and health for those that uh, make, make the decision either way. And we pray that they make it of good conscience and in, and in love and in guidance from you rather than force and, and uh, um, manipulation from others. And we pray, the, uh, pray against the evil of forcing someone to uh, manipulate their bodies in a way that uh, um, they do not believe they should. And I uh, just pray that, uh, that uh, those that are trying to uh, put that pressure on, that they, they stand down, they recognize the, uh, the individual rights that we all have to uh, be sovereign over our own bodies and to make those decisions based on our conscience between um, our relationship with you, Lord, and our guidance from you. We pray that in Jesus' name. We also pray with Nancy Thone for Tom Healy, who is uh, in ICU following chemotherapy infusion. Pray for healing and relief from the pain and the fevers. We pray continued um, wisdom and guidance for the doctors that treat him. And Lord, the medical science that we have at our, uh, that is available to us now is, is spectacular. It's great. The information that you've given uh, them and us uh, about how our bodies heal and, and recover from, from de disease and, and injury is enormous. Um, but we don't always know exactly which way to go. And we just pray for that wisdom for the doctors. We pray for uh, faith for Tom, that no matter where you guide him, where you bring him, and if ultimately you bring him home, Lord, that he steps through that, that gate uh, in celebration. And, uh, and we, uh, we all look forward to that day, Lord, where our time here in time is done and that we live throughout with you in eternity. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father, for uh, the work of healing that needs to be done in all of our lives, some physical, much of it spiritual. I pray over our children and our grandchildren, Lord, a, a powerful healing spirit. I rebuke anything that's trying to destroy them or the value that they have before your kingdom or the beautiful words you want to speak to their heart and the preciousness of who they are as yours. I pray against the bullies that are around us in our own lives. I pray against it first in our own lives if we try and bully others. But ultimately, Lord, I pray for the kind of courage that even the children were able to demonstrate and stand against and shout down. And uh, I pray, Lord, for uh, us to have that kind of commitment as a church, as a people, as a people of this governance. I ask, Father, that uh, you would either bless leaders and empower them and uh, make them wise to follow you with their whole heart or remove them. Do whatever is necessary, Lord, to bring about uh, the cleansing and the clarity and the healing of this nation. Help us to be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. And teach us, Lord, how to stand together. Teach us, Lord, what it means to have harmony in the body. And just show us your ways, Lord. And fill us with hope and conviction and at the same time great joy, Lord. I pray that we would walk with you in integrity. I pray that we would have the gospel upon our lips. I pray that it would bring healing and purpose and confidence in our hearts and lives, that we, Lord, would be people of the word, people of the gospel, people of the truth, Lord Jesus. Come and teach us how to be that. We pray this all in your name and God's people say, amen. Yeah. As we get ready to close for the last song, Notice the phrasing of the last song, He Will Hold You Fast. It's important to remember, uh, you don't hold on to God, God holds on to you. 
You can tell him to let go. You can force him to let go. But he won't. He doesn't want to. So you've got to understand the significance of he will hold you. And that's where your trust is. I trust in the strength of my Lord Jesus, not in my own. We sing this last song after the blessing. I may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
is good all the time. Thank you.